We'll have plenty of time to talk at lunch. But we got to get there. We got to earn the lunch. Before we get started, I want to say a quick shout out to uh, this is also on our website. Is anybody doing Pastor Kevin's uh, crazy at home Bible challenge? There, that thing that says on there, there might be prizes, there will be prizes for this. All right. So it's not too late to start. There's a PDF on the website. There's a worksheet every week that helps you dive deeper into what we're talking about. We're going through one chapter of Mark a week, which in a way is fast when you look at how much content is in each chapter. But you, we need to be look, you know, getting more out of our scripture, and we need to be reading it. And so we put this together, and yes, it's fun. Yes, there's a silly element to it, but it's also a really good thing to do as a family. It's a really good thing to do as an individual. And there will be prizes. And Dan Bishop doesn't need to win all of them. So y'all need to get on this thing. So, Dan, you're not even here. That's a shout out to you. But we're on Mark 4 this week, okay? So let me pray really quick and we'll, we'll go through this. So, Father, we pray that you bless. This is your word, Lord, and we want to treat it as such. We want to study it. And I'm expecting to hear from you, Lord. I pray that you would speak to our hearts and change our lives in your precious name. Lord, and show us what, we, what it is that um, we need to see in order that we might follow you better and lord meet us here jesus we ask that your presence would be here as we gather in your name and bless this time as we study your word in jesus name amen okay mark four mark four and like kevin had talked about i talked about a couple weeks ago the book of mark is written at a fast pace and it's done so intentionally so each chapter has quite a bit of what we would call content and so I like to do this little outline just so you know where we're going. Mark 4 has five chunks to it. There's first there's the parable of the so- sower and the four soils. Then there's a parable of the lamp, the parable of the growing seed, and the p- parable of the mustard seed. And then at the end, we have Jesus calming the storm. And so all of these things kind of tie together and say a similar thing, which we'll get to at the end. But they also say stuff individually. So we want to take time to see all of that as well. Hey, Victor, can you take this down just a tiny bit? I feel like I'm on the... I'll speak louder if necessary. But just so you know what a parable is, I want to make sure that we, uh, if you go, I don't know, you know, if you think, it's not parabola, okay? It's a, is that a math joke for everyone? You can go up a little. But, okay, was that sympathetic? That wasn't even, that was mocking. That wasn't even, that wasn't even sympathetic. All right, minus a point. The, uh, uh. A parable is a simple story to illustrate a moral or spiritual lesson. This is how Jesus taught a lot. You hear about the parables of Jesus. They're not fables, but they're like moral stories. And back in this time, they didn't have things like PowerPoint or whatever we have this. You know, they didn't have screens or pictures or YouTube or ways to depict things. And so stories, little stories might help drive a point home in a way people can remember. And we still do this now. Like in sermon stuff, they call it an illustration. You know what I mean? But it helps us remember what's going on. And so Jesus now, uh, we're moving into where he starts, all of a sudden he starts teaching, teaching in these parables and teaching the group. And so we're going to start right on uh, verse 1, and I'll, I'll read some, and then we'll talk about it as we go. We're going to go through each chunk kind of individually. So verse 1, again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd gathered around him was so large that he had to go into a boat and sat out in the lake while all the people were along the shore of the water's edge. So he kind of made like a stadium sort of thing. Like, you guys all stand on the thing, and he's going to go on a boat out in the middle as everybody's kind of around, you know, which does two things. It means everybody can hear, but it also means, like, people can't run up to him while he's teaching. He taught them many things by parables. And in his teaching, he said, listen. So this is the story now. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seeds, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil and it came up and grew and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. And Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, the 12 others came around him, the disciples, the ones he just appointed last chapter and last week, asked him about the parables. They said, he told them, so they asked him about him, like, what's the deal with the parables, you know? And he told them this, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables so that, and then he's quoting Isaiah here, they may be 
ever seeing but never perceiving, and ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Now, at first reading, that sounds like, wait a minute, so Jesus doesn't want them to understand? You just said the parable was a thing to make people understand, and now he doesn't want them to understand? Let me explain that. Um, there's a little bit that, there's actually a Greek word in here that makes this translation a little odd. People actually kind of take it different directions because of that. But generally, what you're going to see in this chapter is a pattern. Um, the, he's kind of saying to the disciples, you guys get what I'm talking about, and I'm teaching about what I'm talking about, but I'm not giving the whole punchline yet. Like in the book of Mark, Jesus, there, there's an increasing amount of awareness to the disciples and to everyone and to the people who are supposed to be reading this, who Jesus is, what, is he in, what he is in fact fulfilling. Like the scripture I just read earlier from Isaiah 9, he's fulfilling all these things. And people's eyes, are, they're catching on to this. And, but you're going to see in the latter part of Mark, when he's saying, I am the Messiah, they're like, we get that. And he's like, now this is the kind of stuff Messiah's do. And they go, wait, what? Wait, wait, hold on. You know, this is the kind of thing. When you follow Jesus, you think you got him pinned down. Then he does something that you wouldn't think he would do. And that's just what it's like to follow Jesus. And so what you have here is Jesus saying, I'm not giving them the punchline yet, but I am teaching them the truth. But like this Isaiah reference, in that part of Isaiah, Isaiah, he's saying, I'm going to prophesy all this stuff, but you guys aren't going to listen. You know, you don't want to hear what I'm saying. You don't want what I'm offering. And so there's this kind of reference, like we remember we talked about Pharaoh in Exodus, where his heart was hardened. God was making the point over and over again who he was, and at some point he's like, I'm not interested, you know. And so it's kind of sets up this, and you'll see this pattern throughout where you're involved, and I'm involved, meaning Jesus is giving it out. And if you have ears to hear it, if you want to hear, you can dig into it and find out the truth about it. But it's not always just on the surface, you know, like, come out and tell me this. And, you know, you, you always try to boss Jesus around. Do this this way. And he's like, you don't have to do that. You know, <laughs> remember, I'm God and you're not, you know. And so he's laying it out for everybody, but you have to engage with it. To, to, to get the revelation for it to happen. And we'll talk about this more as these different stories start to stack up. And what you start to see is hungry people can see it, you know. Desperate people, you know, hungry people see food and things that filled people don't. Some of y'all been there, you know what I mean? And so this is the kind of thing he's laying out. And, and just, just to make sure you understand, that, like we're, we're just about to talk about a lamp on a stand and Jesus' whole point about that. So keep this in mind when we get to that. And, and then also the timing. Like Jesus wants to reveal him. Like if you've noticed before, he's doing some things with people and saying, hey, I'll heal you, but don't tell everybody about it. And they're like, okay. And then they go tell everybody about it. And he's like, okay, it's not time yet for this. You know what I mean? And uh, so it's Jesus doing things his own way. And then also this. Who just asked him to explain all this to them? The disciples. And he's like, well, you guys get all this already. That's why you understand what I'm saying. But this is immediately what we find in verse 13. Then Jesus said to him, don't you, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? You know, so the guys who are supposed to get it are still struggling to get it, which this is okay. This should encourage us, you know. I think we live in this idea that, like, I'll just understand everything always the first time, you know, when it comes to God. Everything else in life I learn, but in this one, I, just, I should just know, Right. And uh, the answer is no, because these guys are struggling the same way that we would. We're like, yeah, I, don't, I think I get it, but can you help me a little? And then he does. This is the mercy that Jesus is like, okay, the farmer sows the word. So there's a farmer. He's like, he's even like using him himself, you know. And these guys, when he's talking to this group of people, they're all farmers. So it's not like, you know, imagine a farmer, you know, and you're thinking of some cartoon or something like that. They're like, you know, farmers, like you guys, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and they sow seed, but, and then he says, verse 15, some, some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes it away. The word that was, or, or sorry, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. So some people, he's saying, hear these words that Jesus is saying, or that, you know, we might be saying, or the truth of the gospel, and it just bounces off. It's like hard. Remember, like, the hard hearts? It's like this path has been, the, there's nothing for the seed to go into, and it's just immediately, it does nothing. So you hear the truth, but you don't want to hear it. It's stopped. So it's immediately gone. Others are like seeds sown in rocky places. They hear the word, and at once receive it with joy. So, like, the seed go, has a pocket to grow, but it's all rocky, you know? 
Not Rocky Balboa, just rocks. Sorry. Now I lost my place. <laughs> Others, like seed sown in rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they, do not ha- they, since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Some of us have lived this. Some of us have seen people this way. Where they, they, you hear, I understand what God, I, I see it, I get it. But then struggle comes, it's like, oh, this must, that's not what I was signed up for, you know, and it dies away. Still others, like seeds sown among the thorns, they hear the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires of things that come in and choke the word. Y'all remember that, that prayer we use sometimes when we pray for the offering? And to talk about the things that choke the word, that's literally what they're referring to here. You know, we don't want to be caught up in the things that choke the word. So some people are like this. The seed grows, but then the, the worries of the world choke the word and make it unfruitful. And others are like seeds sown in good soil. This is the one you want to be. You hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. Some 30, some 60, some 100 times what is sown. And, the, and the, we might pick, not pick up on this, but the farmers would be like, that's unusually high the numbers there. Like, that's not usually what you get. It'd be like saying, I invested in some stock and I got a hundred, you know, fold return. You'd be like, that's, can I, what was that? I would like to know, you know. It's not usually how that works, especially these days. But, so Jesus is saying, he's sowing the word, the same word to everyone. But the soils, meaning how we are, affects how effective it is. And he's, in this case, he's saying like 25% of the different soil types, you know, like one of them works and the others work, don't work for varying different reasons. Now, the question I have always had, and I'm not sure there's an actual answer here, is how do you be good soil? Like, be good soil. Like, let's try to be, like, who wants to be the path soil? No one. Who wants to be the rocky soil? Again, not Rocky Balboa, but like the one that you die. And then who wants to be the thorny soil? You're choked out by weeds and all that. It's like nobody wants to be any of that stuff. Everybody wants to be the good soil, right? But based on this math, 75% of us might be some version of those bad soils. So I don't know if we can change the kind of soil we, we are, but I think he's encouraging us to like engage again. You know, this is where you're involved in it. He's like, I'm doing the same thing for everyone. It's just some people are, you know, not receiving it. And you'll start to see these, these other shorter parables start to stack up this way. The lamp on a stand, verse 21. He said to them, do you bring in a lamp and put it under a bowl or a bed? That'd be like turning on a light and putting it under a pillow or something. And the answer is obviously no, because it doesn't do anything. Instead, do you not put it on a stand or for whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed. This is where you start to see what Jesus is doing. Like, you may not understand now, but the idea is that you will understand if you engage with it. Whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed. Whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out in the open. Those who walk in darkness have seen a great light, not a light that then is hidden under a bowl. He's like, there's no point in that. Why would I do that? If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And and this is a reference. The the Bible likes to use the word light as as a reference to wisdom. And so what you have is Jesus saying, uh, well, let me get to this next part. So hear that light as wisdom, like this light is shining and it's illuminating things spiritually and illuminating things in every way you could illuminate something, having your eyes open. Walking in darkness have seen a great light. And then he says this in verse 24, Consider carefully what you hear, he continued. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and even more. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken away from them. And you're just like, wait a second, what is that talking about? Again, think about the light. Jesus is giving you the light. And like the soil's different amount, you might accept and you, like, so he's like, so I have a tiny bit of light that I've understood from Jesus. He's like, well, are you going to use that or not? I'm like, I don't know, I want to wait and see what else happens. Then it kind of dies out, you see what I'm saying? But if you take it and you go, okay, what can I see with this? Oh, wow. And then it's like, whoa, it's brighter. And then you're like, whoa, wow. And then it keeps getting brighter. So that's what he's trying to say here. It's like if you engage with, you don't have to have it all. Like this is encouraging. This should be encouraging to our children, to anybody. You go, I, I look, I, I just, I'm new to this church thing. It's not, a, I don't know what I'm talking about. I can't do anything. I don't, you know, these people here have been going to church for like 20 years. I don't know anything about this. It's like, it doesn't matter. Are you using the parts you got? 
Okay? This is important stuff. Because if you are, then you're the good soil. And it doesn't matter if you think that this other person is whatever. It doesn't really matter what you think anyway. But, like, they might be rocky soil. Like, things might be dying or going dimmer, right? There's no passive acceptance. Like I said before, last week, I think we're, you know, we always want to find that line where, like, where does me being not cool with God start? And I want to, like, try to hang out, like, as close to this line as possible. You know, like, this, this whole attitude is not right. We need to be, engaged, like, going as deep as we can with whatever we have, okay? Knowing that we're not all starting with the same thing. And I, I did put a note here, because uh, I understand some of us are in quite a bit of darkness. And so you might be like, oh my gosh, now you just gave me another impossible thing to do. You know, you, you need to also put this against with Jesus saying, take my yoke upon you. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. He wants to alleviate that burden, but we'll get to that at the end. And this is also not a life hack. I put that in there, you know. We're, I, you have to say that because, like, we think so much. It's like, okay, I got it. If I do this, everything's cool, right? And I'm like, well, I mean, in a in a eschatological sense, yes. But in like a day to day, yeah, you're gonna have some t- you're gonna have some hard times, you know. But let's go. To, here's another parable of seed. Remember, he's talking to uh, farmers. Verse 26. He also said, "This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground, night and day. Whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows." though he does not know how. All by itself the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. Again, it's the soil that does it, you know. And in this situation right here, that's encouraging to me. Y'all, you know, I'm throwing out the thing in the soil. You know, so it's like it's not always up to me. Like if I'm asleep, it's like does this work or not, you know. And it's the Holy Spirit. Paul actually talks about this um, because... We like to, especially in our day, we like to blame everybody for everything, you know. They're like kind of, everybody's a victim all the time, you know. And I'm not saying that some people aren't, but I'm just saying it's become a, a norm for everybody all the time, you know. And we also like to, uh, in an opposite way, kind of get a, re- a strange pride by associating ourselves with things, you know. And... <laughs> Paul runs into this in 1 Corinthians because, like, Paul is Paul, you know, later on in the Bible, just in case you don't know, Paul's an important person. He's starting a lot of churches all over the place. But there's also, like, other guys doing that, too. He's like, we're on the same team. And some of these people are like, well, I mean, I'm not on your team. I'm on the other guy's team. And he's like, what are you talking about? There's one team. He's like, did did I die for you? Jesus is the only one. And in 1 Corinthians 3, you see this. He goes, you're still worldly. This is Paul talking now. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, you are not, or are you not worldly? Like, his whole point is like, you're going to tell me you're not worldly, but you guys are fighting with each other, you know? Are you not acting like mere humans? For one, one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos. Are you, not be, are you not mere human beings? What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord assigned each to his task. He goes, we're just seed thrower guys, right? I planted the seed, but Apollos watered it. But God had been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor, for we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. And so I think that it, it steers us, which you're going to start seeing this all come to focus at the very end when Jesus calms this storm. Values start to change. And I think God is, Jesus is inviting us into that. And it's disruptive. Like, you can't have, like, I'll just have a taste of Jesus. That makes me good, right? And he's like, it's completely and totally, it takes over everything. Remember, we talk about life and death being born again. These are like lines you pass through. You don't go back. It's not like partial, you know. You, do, you are accountable for the amount of light that you have. But your following of it is either you're following it or not. It's not like some, you know. I'll take it into consideration. Because at that point, who is God? You, you know? And we're saving the same way Adam and Eve the whole time. Well, I'm going to be God over my life, not you, you know? I'm not going to surrender to what you say. That's what, really what dynamic is going on. And I'm going to skip this. Parable of the mustard seed. This is verse 30. Again, he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? 
Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which was small, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that birds can perch inside it, perch in its shade. And again, he picks something that's uncommon. It's like this is a small seed that turns into a big plant. And um, he probably picked it because it was something local everybody knows. You know, I heard some people say that like, a lot of the stuff he was using as illustrations are kind of like around, you know. It'd be like me going like, this is like a TV in this way, or like a chair, you know. You can sit on it, you know. And like Jesus was like, it's like a mustard. You know, it's like this, you know, that kind of, he could be just gesturing at things that are there. But also, trees are used in the Bible, lots of different places, imagery as, you know, pictures of kingdoms. You know, you see it in a couple different places. Um, even I think Gideon's son, used, like there's like elements where you, you see these things show back up. And the idea, again, in this chapter, that something that starts small grows and becomes something completely different over time, not always instantaneously. And Craig Keener says that the kingdom starts in obscurity, but it ends in glory. Like Kevin was talking about at the end in Revelation, everybody's going to get the memo, you know. But right now, everybody's at varying levels of understanding of that. And it's our job to help people with that. Okay? So continuing on so we can get to this main point here. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand at that time. See, again, as much as they could understand, which isn't like everything all the time. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. Well, when he was alone with his disciples, he explained everything. And then we go immediately to this. Okay? Remember, he was in a boat, so the evening came, and he said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side leaving the crowd behind. So they're on the Sea of Galilee here. Like, let's go over there where, like, there's other people, okay? Leaving the crowd behind, they, they, took, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There was also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat. So they're now in a bad storm in a boat. Some of these guys are fishermen, so you think, okay, we got this figured out, but... It's a, it's a bad storm. They're in a bad storm. So the boat was nearly swamped, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. Okay, just hold that there. You know, like, we like to read over these things. You're in a storm. The boat is being swamped, and the guy in charge is asleep on a cushion. Okay. Okay. Hold that. The disciples woke him and said, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up and rebuked the wind and the waves. Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and then was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Remember the growing thing? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and waves obey him. So here's the thing. Here's how all this stuff kind of comes together. There's a lot in the statement they say to Jesus. Don't you care? Is what they ask him. Like in the situation, their life's in a mess. There's impending doom. A real thing, you know, like, is the storm real in this story? Not a trick question. Yes. What, from what we know of Jesus, does he care? Yes. So, this is an interesting chain of events. And you could even, like, go as far as that, you know, before I followed Jesus, I didn't get into situations where the boat was sinking. You know what I mean? Like, some of us, it's like, literally because I'm following you and doing what you said, Jesus, my life is now in danger and I'm, it's screwed up. So, like, it's your fault all, it's not just like, you know, things happen. It's like, this is literally because of what I, you said, you know. It didn't used to be this way, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. And the response we have is, don't you care? Can't you see what I'm going through? Don't you care at all? And the weird thing is, Jesus is <laughs> asleep. This is the funniest thing to me. Um, Which says a lot, okay? Because when you're going through a storm boat, storm situation, 
to look over and see Jesus asleep is not reassuring, okay? I promise you that, all right? I do want to make a distinction since we just uh, uh, we went through the story of Elijah and Elisha, and when Elijah's challenging the prophets of Baal, and he's like, then nothing is happening because their God's fake. He's like, oh, maybe he's asleep, or maybe he's using the bathroom, you know, in a dismissive sort of way. That's not what Jesus is doing. I just want to say this ahead of time. He's having an appropriate response to the surroundings, and he's inviting everybody along, with, okay? He's not dismissive. He knows what he's doing, you know? And I think he all the whole time intended to calm everything, but he, there's, there's things going on which we want to address. And the first thing is this. If Jesus isn't dismissive, um, I think we can take this conclusion. There are, there's a good chance that many of the things that we spend the most time worrying about, though real, don't pose the threat that we perceive. Okay? Let me say this again. There is a good chance that many of the things we spend the most time worrying about, though real, meaning they are actually happening, they don't pose the threat, the threat that we perceive. Simple question. Are you in the boat with Jesus or not? Jesus isn't in the boat. You have a good reason to worry. If he is situation is immediately changed. <laughs> and then when you go into that question of like, remember a couple weeks ago, we were talking about like through the gospel of Mark, the famous question, what would Jesus do? You know, or as I said, like they heard it rephrased, what would Jesus have me do? So if I'm, I've been now like one of these guys appointed as one of his disciples to go out and do this stuff that he's doing. I'm going to be like a little Jesus. Like I'm going to go do the kinds of things Jesus is doing. Do we all want to do that? Yes. We would all, what would Jesus do? Okay, right. In the storms of the boat, He's asleep. Is that what he wants me to do? Or like, what, you know, what would being like Jesus in that moment look like? Worrying and running around or being asleep? This feels strange to talk like this, doesn't it? But literally there, what would Jesus do? He's asleep on a cushion, which is like a nice little detail, I think, you know. <laughs> He's comfortable, okay? He's comfortable and asleep during the storm, okay? And in case you think, well, yeah, Jesus doesn't have anything to worry about. He's always, he's always, you know, there's never any time. Well, there's actually, we'll get to it in Mark 14, but a flash forward, just so you can have this in your mind, okay? The disciples have decided, like we often do, that this situation is terrible, and we're going to die, and Jesus obviously doesn't care, to the point that we need to wake him and challenge his authority as God and everything. Don't you even care about us? And Jesus has been asleep. So we have to wake him to have this conversation during the struggles of our life. Again, real struggles. I'm not putting anybody's struggles down, okay? But I'm trying to put these things in perspective. Jesus' response to the struggles, the things that are fretting us in our life, or so many of them, he's asleep, not dismissive. He's just trying to make a statement. It's not as big a deal as you think. Then you flash forward to Mark 14, where Jesus is about to go to the cross, the crucifixion, and he's, he knows what's coming. And he goes to pray beforehand, and he says to the disciples, I'm going to pray. Can you keep watch and pray with me? Because I don't want you to fall into it. He's like, this is serious. And then he goes and prays, and he comes back, and what does he find them? Asleep. So the story that we have to res wrestle with is that we are very oftentimes very awake and concerned about things that Jesus is asleep to, and very asleep to things Jesus is awake to. You don't want to do that. <laughs> and eventually the disciples, again, in this getting more and more of it, they get in line and they get, it, they get it worked out, but like this is the natural human place that God has to help get us out of. You're asleep when, or you're awake and worried when you should be asleep or at least be at rest. And then <laughs> you're asleep when you should be awake. And I can't give you the, can you give me the list of those things? It doesn't work that way. You have to work on this. You have to engage yourself, all right? But then Jesus calms the storm, which I'm not sure, like, just based on the end, I'm not sure they thought that was what, like, that was what they were asking. You know what I mean? So that's, again, when you engage with God, like, they're like, hey, our boat's being swamped. Don't you even care, which is offensive and rude, you know, considering he's God and everything. And his response is, you know, peace be still, right? That's, I, I like that translation. This one says quiet, be still, but peace be still. And everything's like, you know, which I think he had the plans to do anyway. But 
it kind of has this interesting effect where, like, you could ask yourself, what is he calming? Is he just calming the situation? Or is he calming us too? Like, he's saying, you could have this peace, and you could be still, even when all this is happening, like I was, on the cushion, but you're choosing to act like everybody else, or like the surroundings, you know? You're letting the surroundings dictate how you behave. And it calls me and ask this, like, what does our experience, this is a rhetorical question for you to take and ponder, what does our experience in life, what does what you're going through right now change about who Jesus is? Is he, like, earning his godness? You know what I mean in this moment? Is he not God when he's asleep on the boat? But in the moment when you're in the boat in this swamp, it doesn't feel like he's doing a very good job of being God right now, right? What does our experience change about who Jesus is? Because I think what he's inviting us to, I think we need to learn to be people who can rest with Jesus within the storm. Not in denial, okay? I want to be clear about this. Like, Jesus isn't like, what, what, what's going on? You know, like, I don't, what, what, you know, like that kind of thing. I don't think that's it, you know? And it's not like Elijah being like, maybe your God's using the bathroom, you know, and he can't hear you right now, you know? It's not like that. He's like, I am here. I am with you. You're literally in a boat with me, and you're totally acting like you, you're not with God. Why? And Jesus is kind of like, don't you guys have any faith yet? And he's saying, you could be at rest with, the, that, that peace be still could have been there the whole time, no matter what they're doing out there. I think Jesus wants us to be people. He's inviting us to be people who can be at peace, at rest. Peace be still to you, no matter what the storms are doing outside. Who wants that? I want that. And I think it'll be increasingly important over the next 14 months. He who has ears, let him hear, right? How do we do that? You go, yes, this sounds good. I want to do that. How? Okay. Um, the answer is found in the parables we just read. You don't have, it's not like, following Jesus isn't like magic pill stuff. There are moments when things happen quickly, but oftentimes it builds over time, and it's us engaging with what we have. And he's laying this out in these parables. He, he causes the growth, and the, the yield is not natural. You know, it's not something we earn and build, but we have to engage with what we have. Because when you use the light, you have the little things add up, and... and God causes the growth and more light comes. Ultimately, you end in glory like the tree. You know, it starts in obscurity and darkness, and then a light comes on, and then you share the light. And the light, you know, even, I mean, I'm not trying to be too, you know, but like, it strikes me as funny, even though it was a bit of an <laughs> overcommitment. Uh, the small prison like buildings we painted made an impact on the campus of that school. And we're, by the time we're done, we're going to have painted a lot of stuff. And it's going to look a lot better, okay? And I hope it spreads. I don't just mean like we're going to start painting schools as a church or anything like that. But I do mean this kind of thing. You know, that there's a hope now that things can change. Things aren't just stuck the way they are. But there's a weird, and, and I think it, it, it goes to this kind of pattern. I, I think I put a chart in there. Did I put a chart in there? Yeah, there's this. Like, so you have a revelation of Jesus, and as that increases, your peace within the storms also increase, but you also get more revelation, which, could, which this could start, of, I could have done it if I was more accurate. It could have like curved like this, like as like a geometric, like as an increasing rate of increase as you go across. So this is actually slightly inaccurate, but go to something else. The, uh, there is this weird plot twist at the end, okay? Because... Uh, Jesus calms the, he calms the storms, and he also is off. He's saying, guys, you could have been calm the whole time, but that calm actually causes them to have this kind of weird uncalm where they're like, wait a minute, who is this guy? You know, now, like, I didn't, he was going to wake him up to, like, help out or something, and now it's like there's, he, the winds and the waves are doing what he's telling them to do. 
You could have done that the whole time. Like, that's, that's disturbing, you know. We love to imagine Jesus as our little friend. He always agrees with me and thinks everything I do is cool. And then um, he does kind of what I tell him to, right? You know, is that cool? Yes. All right, good. You know, that kind of thing. And instead, Jesus is, like, doing things that we're not expecting. And it's very, like, some of y'all have been there. Have, has anybody been there? When Jesus does something, it's something you're like, that's not what I was expecting him to do. I'm, comf- I, I'm slightly uncomfortable by that, you know. We don't always like to verbalize these things, but that's what happens. You become, <laughs> but it's the reality of it, you know. It's changing. It changes us for good. So we, we end these Super Second Sundays with communion. So Kayla or Kevin or, or not Kevin, Justin, whoever's going to come up, play some sweet nothings in the background. Because I think you see the disciples, again, we have this journey. Remember that the, the parables are laying out this growing thing, this growing pattern, growth of plants, growth of light, growth of whatever. You see the disciples struggling, you know, because it's the beginning. We're only on Mark 4. There's a lot more chapters, right? So they're trying to figure out, you know, what's happening following Jesus, just like we are. Like, we can take encouragement from this. And if you remember all the way back in verse 17, you see this. But since you have no root... They last only a short time. When trouble, like a boat storm, or persecution comes because of the, world, because of the word, they quickly fall away. It's kind of like where they're at. They're like, I was good. I liked you healing people. But now we're going to die, and I don't like it as much anymore. I don't like being around you dying. You know, this kind of thing. But they're on the journey, like we are, to being what you find in verse 20, Others, like seed sown in good soil, hear the word and accept it. And then it produces this crop through the Holy Spirit of 30, 60, 100 times what was sown. So even this tiny little thing, this tiny little change in your life could change everything for who knows who or who knows what people. You know, don't put a limit on that because it's not something you get to really do. So going from not having roots and when struggle comes, you fall away to accepting it. And it's always accepting it. And that's why I want to say we're ending with communion today because it's, it fits with this really well in that this is Jesus' gift. When Jesus goes to the cross to deal with sin, to bring, take back the keys of sin and death and offer eternal life to us, he leaves the disciples with this practice to do in his, in his memory. And he says that this bread now is like my body, and I'm giving it to you. For these things, take it and eat it. Like, actually, it goes inside you, and it becomes part of you, this little thing. And then he said, this cup is my blood of a new covenant that's given for you. Drink it. It becomes, you accept it. You know, you can say, I, I, I'd rather not. You know, but he's saying it's a gift. You can have it. But it comes into you. It actually becomes it becomes you. You see what I'm saying? And then the, the Holy Spirit does the rest. So I need four youth to come up here. We're going to end with communion together. Quattro. One, two, three, four. All right, four. Okay, good. All right, so this is the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. And then this bread is representative of Jesus' body. He said it was broken for us. So I want to say two things. The way we take communion here is is a process where you take a piece of the bread and then you dip it into the cup and then you eat it. And everybody's invited to take part in it. We're also going to start doing something um, at the end. When we're done, they're going to set everything back. And since we have lunch, parents, at your discretion, okay, you can go get your children from Maranatha Kids and bring them back and have communion together. And then whatever bread is left, we always go and put out on the lunch table, okay? But after the service, give some space for that to happen for parents who want to come. But we want to invite you to come. I'm going to pray and then come take the body and blood of Jesus and accept it. And let's pray that we would be good soil. So, Father, I pray that as we receive your word, as we receive your body and blood, Lord, that we would become and be good soil to receive your word and that we would produce in our life in every way the types of yields that are hundredfold and all that kind of thing, but also be the kind of people that can be at peace 
with you in the storms of our lives, no matter what's going on, knowing that you can, pe- that you can bring stillness whenever is necessary, and that you, ca- that you are stillness, and that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. In Jesus' name, amen. So come forward as you will.